Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, which is available now as a paperback, an audiobook, and the ebook is free. Yes, free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. Um, for more information about that, as well as some of my other books and more importantly, interviews with thousands of literary agents, editors, authors, all the world's best people, head to middlegradeninja.com. Uh, tonight, we are talking with none other than Mark Gottlieb of uh, Trident Media Group. I couldn't be more thrilled to talk with you, Mark. Uh, thanks so much for making time for esteemed audience and me. Uh, the esteemed audience knows that I never summarized anyone else's book or anyone else's biography because how painful for you to have to sit there and, and listen to me do either of those things. Um, so the best place to start is if you would give a esteemed audience kind of an overview of your background. Sure. And, and thank you for having me on the show again. Uh, again, thank you. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And yeah, to tell people a little bit about myself and Trident, uh, Trident Media Group is a literary agency in New York City. It's uh, probably one of the largest uh, agencies. Uh, we lead the, uh, the agency world in number of deals and amount of money for deals every year consecutively since 2004. That's according to the publisher's marketplace. So no, no other agency is doing as many deals nor for as much money. It just, it's not said to brag. It's meant as what I feel is good information for your viewers. Um, and uh, there's every kind of author there, from fiction to nonfiction, children's books and graphic novels. You'll find New York Times bestselling authors, major award-winning authors, you name it. Uh, the agency's been around for a little over 20 years. The company controllers have been in the business much longer than that. Uh, I've been at the agency for a little over 10 years, uh, and I typically lead uh, Trident Media Group, the agency where I work, a number of deals in any, most any given six to 12 month period. And uh, it's not said to toot my own horn. It's just what I think the interesting thing about the data point, I guess, for your listeners is uh, most of those authors were new or debut authors. So I think if someone's a new or debut author, they might, may stand a good chance, you know, of getting published and working with me. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and, and my taste really runs the gamut from fiction to nonfiction, children's books of all ages and graphic novels. It's um, almost simple to ask, is there anything that you don't care to represent? Uh, you know, I think it's interesting to, to keep life varied. Um, I keep surprising myself. Like there was recently I did a, a book deal for a, an illustrated comic book, illustrated cookbook, which explains kind of the uh, sort of the strange names behind Chinese dishes. Like why, um, why does the name translate, for instance, to ignored by dog um, buns? Shalom uh, Bao, they, they, uh, the story goes, uh, the buns were so good when the chef invented them, one of them fell on the floor, a dog was eating it, and it was so delicious that no matter how hard the owner tried to get the dog's attention, like the dog couldn't be bothered. So, um, and so it's this origin story of all these, these named dishes, like Buddha jumps over the wall and stuff, and it's kind of this all ages graphic novel, um, cookbook graphic novel, really. Um, so yeah, there's uh, that one surprised me, you know. So you have like a um, I don't know, maybe bucket list is the wrong word, but like a hope list of I want to cross off every type of genre, <laughs> every type of book. Um, I think more so that just when I see that a book can work and it's interesting and seems promising to me, I I want to work with with that author in that book. Um, so I don't try and rule stuff out. I think a lot of people want to be known as you know, that's the de facto agent or editor you go to when, you know, you want to do children's fantasy or you want to do uh, a picture book or you want to do like contemporary young adult romance or something like that. But um, I figured people would come to know me by my style of working, my brand of representation being, you know, how I, I work with authors and publishers and, you know, what our agency is like, not necessarily like oh, that's the person you go to when you do that book. It seems like the world's too interesting a place. Like, I don't know anyone who listens to just one kind of music or one album over and over again, you know? It's kind of like that for me. 
So if you want to be known for the experience that authors can look forward to, um, and they're, they're Googling you as we speak, some of them have already, have doubtless already heard about you, but they're Googling you and they're, they're, the queries are hitting your inbox moments after we started the show, I have, I have no doubt. Um, but what kind of experience can they be looking forward? Uh, what, what kind of representation do you specialize in? So I think what makes our agency unique is it's, it being a big agency, there's lots of different departments there in service to the client. So we do a lot of work in book to film and TV, audiobooks, foreign rights for books and translation, and everything else an author can need in their life. Like we do, you know, obviously the accounting, the contract review, um, and we have a digital marketing department. What's unique about that is because it's a bigger agency and we don't farm that business out, what it does is it frees up a lot more of my time to work with authors, to help them in their career, wherever they feel my help is wanted or needed by them. And it makes those folks, you know, a lot more directly answerable to me and the client than if it were, you know, again, if it were farmed out. Um, and then it being a bigger agency, you know, we are better poised to help authors properly exploit the rights to their books, whereas a smaller agency, you know, might want to give more rights away to a publisher just in exchange for what they think is a little more money, but it's a lot more economically sound for authors to hold on to as many rights as they can and later sell them, you know, to an independent publisher or third party publisher. Um, and we're equipped to do that uh, because all of that is there. So I, I think that is one thing that makes us unique. And, and the other is, um, you know, it's actually a family business where I work. So the owner of the company and I, we share the same last name. It's no coincidence. Uh, I mention it because, um, you know, clients of mine benefit from, from my unique position in that they then gain lots of visibility, uh, lots of individual attention, and therefore access to all the great resources I tried it. So, you know, I, th I guess people can say what they want about nepotism, but it's, it's not without its virtues. It certainly benefits clients of mine at the agency. Um, and, you know, the authors of mine are, you know, they don't have to worry, like, where's my agent going to be tomorrow? They can really grow with the agency. Back when I worked a day job in finance, <clears throat> the uh, owner of the company I worked for, his son, uh, joined the college, uh, joined the company fresh out of college, and was assigned to my team. I don't remember if I was managing at that point or if I was just a team lead, but he he was under me. I'm like, oh my gosh, the, the boss's son. <laughs> and this is this is gonna be a nightmare. And he was the hardest working employee I ever had. I couldn't say nothing but good things about him. He'd grown up within the company, he knew the culture, he hit the ground running, he was a fantastic, he was, was a financial sales, he was a fantastic salesman, um, he had the top numbers. Just um, smile when I think about it, was what a, what, a, what a great employee, what a capable person. And you were born into the industry, right? You, you talk about, um, you went to, was it New Hampshire to see Janet Ivanovich, and you went to a Japanese restaurant to see Dean Koontz. Uh, this is as a child, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, both my parents worked in book publishing. And so I, I grew up uh, in this world. And, you know, I, um, I I always had like an inkling I might be doing the family business. It became more of a reality when, you know, we opened our own company. Uh, before that, you know, uh, we ran the William Morris Agency's book department, but then formed our, our own agency and basically you know, took all that, uh, with us. Um, but yeah, I grew up around authors and, and interesting people and the, the, like your background there are, and actually you can't see it cause it's, it's lighting these walls on that side, but I'm actually in the study. So there's, there's books all around me. Um, and, uh, yeah. So when I went to school, I, you know, I thought, you know, okay, I could go to, sure. I could go to uh, Columbia or Harvard and get, a you know, be study comparative literature and then go into book publishing. But then sure, I would know a lot about books and literature, but what would I know about the book business? And at the time at Emerson College, it was one of the only schools in the country with an undergraduate study in book publishing. Before that, you couldn't even get a graduate degree in book publishing. You could only do like a certificate program basically which evolved out of the Harvard uh, Radcliffe program and then Columbia University picked it up. But basically you spent, you know, I don't know what it was, 
four weeks or, or, or maybe some months, and then you got a professional certificate. Instead, I went out for it at Emerson, and it was an interesting time to be doing that because it was only the second year the university had, or excuse me, the college had formed uh, that area of study. And so you could actually see the curriculum being built around you as a student. Um, and the interesting thing was they needed people to come in and teach this. And so a lot of them were, you know, professors, adjunct professors, but people who worked in the publishing industry. You know, they weren't just talking about it in theory, they were also living it in their professional lives. So my book editing professor was actually a book editor. You know, my book marketing professor, she worked for Houghton Mifflin Harcourt and did, did their marketing. Um, so it, it prepared you in a lot of ways. And you, uh, while you were there at Emerson College, College, you became the president of its publishing club, right? Then you established the Wild Press? So yes, the, the year, my freshman year there, the people who were a year ahead of me that same year, they started uh, the Undergraduate Students for Publishing Club or Pub Club as it was like casually known. And um, they, it was done kind of out of necessity in that, like I mentioned, a lot of the curriculum was being built around us. So we wanted more publishing courses you know, for those who wanted to go into the publishing industry, but mostly what was available to us was creative writing classes, literature classes, maybe the occasional, you know, publishing type classes. So we brought in like industry professionals. We, we taught each other, you know, the publishing process. And then sometimes I would find like some of the, the curriculum we put together, like being taught in a classroom. You know, I called the professor out on it one time and, and he said, well, wait a minute, this is an academic community. So this is all, you know, shared information. <laughs> so I said, okay, sure. And, um, but by the time I was a, a senior there, there were a lot more um, publishing uh, courses. And yes, we started a small press there called Wild Press. It's still in existence. I think they're publishing, last I heard, like, four chapbooks a year, which is great. You know, we had just done one in starting and that was in the last semester of our senior year. So it, it seems like they're doing that every semester, which is great. They have a hands-on publishing project uh, that they're doing every year, the students. It sounds like it would be almost fair, and we wouldn't say this, but it would be almost fair to say that you built part of the curriculum for the program uh, between establishing the uh, the press for, for students to continue to work in and, and learn that way. And also from some of the notes, it sounds like the professor uh, um, summarized. <laughs> well, I'll tell you a funny story, actually. So that same professor, he taught a few different courses. He taught book editing, general book publishing overview, and kind of like an advanced publishing overview. By the time we were in our senior year, and he was teaching an advanced uh, publishing overview class, which is also taught to graduate students, and the second book editing class, which I took, is also taught to graduate students. Um, he did a segment of the course on contracts, and he said, I want you all to kind of make a mock contract and all the things you think are in there, and so people were going online and trying to find what might be in a publishing contract, but they weren't really sure, and then I came to the class, and I brought there weren't authors' names or their titles in there, but I brought actual copies, publishing agreements, you know, boilerplates basically uh, that had been negotiated between an agency and publisher. And I just had a stack of actual contracts. And he said, where did you get this stuff? You know, this is, this is, these are real publishing agreements. Like this is better than what the students could probably find in their research. You know, they couldn't just knock on a door and, and, and get this stuff. So he ended up sharing that with the class instead. So there was, there was a good give, give and take there. Yeah. So when is your first memory of realizing that, oh, this is something special that's not true for everybody getting to go and hang out with Dean Kuntz or, or Janet Ivanovich in your formative years? You know, <clears throat> you don't realize that until people are telling you that because, um, you know, it's like, if you grow up in a family of lawyers and you have a knowledge of the law, or you grow up in a family of accountants and you have a knowledge of numbers, you know, it's just what you had always been brought up with. So it's second nature. Whereas, you know, I, I didn't begin to realize this stuff until 
um, you know, we grew up just outside of New York City and you can walk around New York City and find, you know, a celebrity walking around any day or sitting in a park or something like that, right? In a restaurant or anything. My mm -hmm. friends were always nervous to go up to someone like that and talk to them or even look at them or ask for their autograph or photo. And I was never afraid to do that because to me, they're just like anyone else. They're ordinary people. They just have extraordinary kinds of lives in the eyes of other people. And, um, you know, you, that's when you begin to realize this stuff where people look at your life and they say, oh, well, that, that's kind of different or that's unusual or that's interesting. Um, and then it starts to click more. It starts to, to make more sense. Otherwise, you know, it just, it's what you're uh, born into. So uh, do you have memories of um, talks around the dinner table or whatever it would have happened? You go into your, your father's office and you're looking at the contracts and you're talking about the best parts of representing an author, philosophies on how to, uh, to help authors, on how publishing should be. Are these the types of conversations that you're, that you're kind of having? Not so much as like, you know, I would be sitting in the back of the car and back then they had those big car phones with the wires and the big antenna on the car. And my dad would be doing his business calls in the car and I'd be sitting and looking and it would be, on, or it might be on speakerphone and I could hear these things going on. Um, so I was like a fly, more so a fly on the wall, I'd say. And then, you know, my contact with authors was like different at a young age. Like I was a big, Back when I was young, Goosebumps, R.L. Stein's Goosebumps was a big thing. There was, the TV show had come out and everyone was reading the books and everyone wanted to have all the books because the covers were amazing. And at the time he was a client at the William Morris Agency. And I said to my dad, I said, can you just get me every book with his autograph made out to my name? And he said, sure. And then I brought them to school and the kids like, they couldn't <laughs> believe it, you know? So it was neat. Yeah, it was fun. So you've got a, a respect for books and, 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 and for the prestige of those from a relatively early age then. Um, when do you fall in love with reading? Is that just sort of hammered into you from birth that you, you will read? Or, or do you discover it on your own? I think a combination of things. I mean, <clears throat> there, was, uh, there was probably a few instances where, well, where it was hammered into me was, probably when I was too young to read, um, you know, Herman Melville's Moby Dick, my father wanted me to read that book. I couldn't fully grasp it at such a young age, but he wanted me reading like the classics. And um, my mom was just happy if I was reading. And um, my dad gave me uh, like some comic books, a stack of comic books, and they were really easy to get into. I think like Graphic novels and comic books have always worked really well for, they call the, the uh, young uh, reading group for boys, um, reluctant readers. You know, they tend to start later than, than girls do in reading. Um, and so I picked up comic books very easily. And then uh, books which were, um, I don't know. Um, I always just had an affinity for, for illustrated books and, um, yeah, there was another book by uh, this author, Wilhelm Reich. It was called uh, Listen, Little Man. And he was like a philosopher and a famous uh, psychiatrist. He, he was actually um, a student of Freud's, like a direct student of his. And uh, it was this illustrated book. And it was easy for me to get into rather than reading like very dense psychology, you know, as a kid. He made it this book kind of for like the everyday layman to enjoy. Um, so yeah. And then where, I think it, where it really clicked for me, cause I, I wasn't fully realizing, like, even when I was in school, I was like, you know, my family wanted me to study publishing, kind of go into the family business. And I didn't really know where my interests lied. I thought maybe I wanted to be a chef. Maybe I wanted to be a photographer. I don't know. Uh, and, um, I was sitting in my book editing class and um, we were reading this book by Scott A. Berg, who's a great biographer. He won the Pulitzer Prize, I think, for his uh, Lindbergh uh, biography. And uh, he wrote this biography about this famed editor in book publishing by the name of Maxwell Perkins, who edited uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway 
and um, uh, Tom Wolf. Uh, and he was like, everyone's, even today, everyone's idea of like the editor's editor, you know, like the, the Steven Spielberg of editors. And um, so this book had so many interesting things, like his letters back and forth between him and Fitzgerald trying to, you know, nail down the character of Nick Carraway and the great Gatsby and things like that. And I was fascinated by this guy's life. Um, and what I was realizing in that moment, at first I thought, sitting in this book editing class, I, was, I thought, oh, I want to be a book editor because I want to help authors. I want to help them fix their books. I want to be almost like a book doctor or something. And um, what I realized in seeing the, the way my, my father was working, um, that um, editors today are not really like Maxwell Perkins anymore. He's kind of like an ideal, you know, he, he's a, per, a type of editor who's kind of come and gone. Agents today are a lot more like, in my opinion anyway, what Perkins was to authors, you know, a shoulder to cry on, a hand to hold, um, much more involved at an earlier stage. What I realized was all, all these editors at publishing houses today were expecting manuscripts to come in as fully polished as possible. It was though they were editor and name only. It's kind of like, I suppose, an editor at a um, newspaper, you know, you, you picture uh, who's the that angry guy from Spider Man uh, at the oh, the, J. John Jameson. Yeah, um, and he's telling journalists, you know, he's an editor, right? But he's telling journalists, go get that story, write that story. He's not actually editing anything. He's it's kind of like someone who acquires projects and then feeds it into this big sausage machine of a publishing house. And um, ed there are some editors to their credit who edit today. You know, they tend to be few and far between. Some just enjoy it, some are of a certain generation. But for the most part, they kind of over acquire the manuscript, oversee it almost in a managerial role and then interface with the agent and author. It's really, most of this takes place at the agency level, I realized. And so that's, and that and from reading that book, I realized that's what I, I wanted to do. I've got lots of follow-up questions. I had read uh, part of an interview or interview or a post she'd written uh, earlier that um, had a Spider-Man reference where you said that uh, a lot of literary agents are kind of uh, opaque and, and difficult to see. And even if there's something not going in and you feel like Spider-Man uh, climbing up on a, on a black glass uh, building, you can't see in the place, to which the nerd in me thought, well, no, but he has spidey sense. So <laughs> at least if, if there's evil going on in, inside the literary agency. But um, you, you, you've you talked about, you're, you're, you're very public. Um, you've made time for us, not only tonight, but you wrote a guest post and faced the seven questions. Yes, I remember. I love that. At middlegradeninja.com. Check those out, esteemed audience. Uh, and then you also, um, you're out and about on, on several podcasts, letting people know what's going on uh, at, at Trident Media Group and letting people know, uh, demystifying being a literary agent. Why is that important to do? So, right. I, yeah, I talk about this in some, some uh, different interviews, that feeling I got this impression among authors that they didn't understand what it literary agents really were or what they really did, certainly for new authors. Um, and that there was this kind of um, air that agents put on of like, this is like a, this is where the cool kids are. And you're not going to know what's going on in the nightclub unless you gain access to it. And when I started working at the agency where I'm at, I'm not saying it was a lot like that, but certainly among other agencies, like you would go to you know, uh, ICM or Writer's House's website, and you would just see a landing page. It was just, maybe it was the earlier days of the internet, but you would just see a landing page with the company logo, the phone number and email, main line email address, and that was it. It was like just hitting a wall. And there was no uh, face or, or humanness to it. And when I started at the agency where I worked, I said to the company controllers, I said, let's not do that. And they said, why not? And I said, they said, all our competitors are doing that. And I said, exactly. We should be different. 
And he said, let's open all the doors, open all the windows, let people look inside and see the wonderful things going on in here and make them feel at home and a part of it. And, and, and that they, they're like a guest, you know? Um, and so we did that and I think it was a much, you know, better result. Uh, and then at the same time, <clears throat> they were very turned off by the idea of us having social media. They said, what do we need a Facebook page for? What do we need a Twitter page for? What do we need an Instagram? And I said, well, all these authors and these publishers are starting to do this. And I think agents are going to kind of get, you know, they're going to wake up to this and start doing this themselves. And I said, we should start doing this. And so I, you know, I, so I built our company website at the time and, and uh, built out our, our social media. Other people run the social media for the most part now at the agency. I, I help maintain the website still, but um, yeah. And that ever since then, no one, uh, no one ever really looked back, you know, it was, it was much, much better that way. Um, so, yeah. Well, here is something I, I noticed right away when I go to the website, because I'm, I'm somebody that uh, has visited lots of agent websites, all for you, esteemed audience, to bring you the best the best interviews available. Um, but um, frequently, there might not even be an email address. There's a fill out this query form, which is obnoxious if you're me, and I just want to say, hey, you want to come on my podcast? I don't want to fill out your whole query form uh, just for that. But you've got not only your email address listed, you've got the, we know which floor of which building you're on. Uh, right, right. Then we've got uh, your phone number, which I'm assuming, I don't know if, it, if, if if somebody dials that number, maybe it's better not to say, if somebody dials that number, it's, you don't pick up and say, hey, it's Mark, do you? Well, so there were, I mean, even within the agency, there was some pushback about that, you know, people, you know, wanted their privacy and they didn't want people to have too much access to them and all that. And so for folks like that, I said to them, just put up your assistant's email and put up your assistant's phone number. You know, um, for me, I put my own contact details on there. I wanted people to feel like they can reach me. Obviously, if they send a query letter, they do have to go through the website because, you know, we ask them to agree to certain terms and conditions, you know, um, most agencies, you know, operate that way. And, um, yeah, so that they just can select the name from there. But other people who want to kind of reach out to us in other ways or something like that, then yeah, the contact details are, th are there on our individual agent pages. I see that helps you weed out people right away if they can't be bothered to check on how the proper submission should come through for you if they're just shooting you a random email. Um, that lets you know that, hey, maybe I'll still look at the proposal, maybe I won't, but this is somebody that's not, what, what signal does that send to you? Well, well, I mean, we created the submissions form on the site because before that people would send like a self-addressed stamp envelope, which no one really does anymore. Um, but they would send that to everyone at the agency. And then, you know, everyone would get the same phone call or everyone would get the same email. And the submission form basically limits that because after someone sends a submission, they get a receipt by email that, okay, we've received your submission. We'll get back to you. I forget what the time frame is, like 30 days. If you, know, you don't hear from us at that point, you can query again or someone else at the agency. But the form will automatically you know, block people from doing kind of these like multiples of, of one submission to every agent at the agency. Um, it's better for the author too that way. You know, they should really think about who they want to work with at the agency and kind of not waste everyone's time. So that's sort of why we do that. I know back in 2016, uh, you had said that you get hundreds of query letters uh, a week. Has that gotten better or worse since 2016? Um, there's still lots of query letters coming in. I, I should actually just put them in a folder and then count them one week and see what, what that's like now. Um, I read them as they come in and if they're not for me, you know, just slide them off my desk. But, um, so it's hard, it's harder for me to know. I think it's probably somewhere around there still and probably, and then you multiply that across agents at the agency and it, it's a lot. Um, but we get a lot of good stuff through referrals, people we reach out to who we know we want to work with. Um, and then sometimes I found stuff in the slush pile. 
um, some good stuff there too on occasion. Um, but yeah, I read all my query letters myself. I don't let other people do it for me. And then in addition to that, you're actively out there seeking out authors, right? Yeah, so I do lots of things to, yeah, find new business at the agency. Like, you know, I read widely just different publications online and things like that. Um, you know, I'm just always have this kind of um, switch turned on in the back of my mind. Like when I'm watching the news or something, I'm like, oh, that's a book, you know, like I was reading an article about there's this guy who's walking around the world on foot with his dog. It's just him and his dog. And, you know, they have like a backpack, like a special hiker's backpack. And he puts his dog in a stroller uh, and they've gone pretty much all around the world. And he's been documenting his journey. And so I, I reached out to him and said, you gotta, you gotta do a book when you, you know, when you finally come home. And so he's thinking about doing that, but that's like, it's just a knee jerk reaction now uh, when I see something, I think it, it could be a book. So on average, how many new clients are you signing per year? Oh, that's, I don't know. That's hard to, hard to guess. I don't know. Um, you know, always signing up new business. You know, this, I mean, I offered representation to some people this week, honestly, because, um, you know, I want to try and help them sell their books. A lot of people during the pandemic were writing. They finally had the time to do it. Uh, so we did get a big influx of submissions from, from all of that, like, 2020 and 2021 were really like busy years in terms of submissions coming in. I would say, um, you know, to date I've done over 250 book deals and some, a lot of them are multi-book deals. So I've been pretty busy. That's like, I think it's amounting to one or two book deals a month, which is good. Um, and, uh, you know, I have probably, you know, two or three dozen clients at this point, but they're all going to be at different points in their career. So, um, you know, one of them might only write one book their entire life, or another one might only every 10 years, someone might be prolific and be writing multiple books a year, but um, I wouldn't be like put off by a big client list necessarily because, you know, again, these authors are all going to be in a different point in their, their lives, their careers. And you stay with authors, right? So if a first project doesn't work out, you're looking for their next project or the first project sells tremendously, you're still looking to keep whatever projects they want to they have coming to you? Oh, I can think of at least a few instances where that happened. One with a graphic novel, one with a nonfiction book and one with a fiction book. And, you know, I invest in, in people, you know, in their careers. I want to, I don't look at authors in terms of book deals. I look at authors in terms of careers. You know, I feel I have a, a vested interest and it being my family business, it's like the person you work with, like they, in their mind, maybe they felt like they had something to prove or something, but also it being a family business, it almost becomes like not just a job or a career or a lifestyle. It's very much so like an extension of you in a way, like another limb. And, um, so you're, you're not worried, you're not thinking the way that another agent might in that most agents are worried where the next book deal is coming from, unless they, they own the company or maybe they're a partner or something at the company. More so, I want to look at authors like over their, the trajectory of their career and look at the horizon with them, try and imagine what's on the other side of it type of thing. So yeah, in those instances, we... Um, we were, it seemed like we were so close, so close, but then it happened eventually, you know, it took two or three tries, but it happened. And I kept just believing in them and, and it paid off. If you're making two book deals a, a month on average, or sometimes more, you're having the success, your clients feel successful. Um, I've read all kinds of praise for you across the internet. Um, you are very good at this. You're uniquely positioned to have been good at this. And I imagine it must make you feel very good to, uh, to be so excellent at something and to, to be excelling in your field. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's busy work, you know, because it's not like um, you could probably do things at a slower pace at a smaller agency, I think. 
um, you know, where I work, it's a lot more demanding of people. You know, they, they really ask for a lot more of people. And sometimes that pressure is just too, too much for some agents. And I, I get it. It's not like Trident is probably not for, for every agent to be, you know, producing at that kind of level. Um, but, um, yeah, it's kind of like the, comp like, um, the company culture, like what you said, the person who you were working with, like he got in there, he understood what the company culture was and, and that's what it is. People really have their nose to the grindstone, uh, where I am. And, um, so I think that's where a lot of, of it comes from. And then I just love the feeling too, of helping authors get published, helping, uh, their book find a home it's like a great feeling I mean ca call it vicarious if you want but it's like you're watching someone and their dream is coming true it's like you you're in the store when someone gets the winning lotto ticket like I'm not the person who's envious and think oh I wish I got the winning lotto ticket I'm like I'm so happy for you like all your dreams are going to come true you could get a percentage of the lottery tickets <laughs> that too yes that's a good good point but yeah, I mean, no, I do, I do this like for, for, because it's personally enriching, you know, I could, it could be worse. Like I could be working for Texaco oil and um, my product is polluting the environment. You know, I could be uh, like one of these uh, guys on wall street, you know, who sure they're making a lot of money, but like, you know, they're, they're taking advantage of the stock market. And um, it's basically like kind of like this legalized betting in a way. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I know you came out of finance, so I don't know how you feel, but I'm just saying. <laughs> That's a good kind. <laughs> not, not, the, not the hedge funds that buy up the um, oh, in, insulin and jack up the price. To, to make the extra profit, none of that evil. No, you're doing good in this world. Um, I'm I'm uh, obviously a book fan, but anybody who's out there helping authors make their dreams come true, I say God bless you and your and your important work. Keep it up. Um, something you had said um, about your day and about the the workload uh, is that. Uh, oh, I can't find it, but you had a quote that there, oh, there really is no average day in the life of a literary agent, or at least there shouldn't be. For when a literary agent's days begin to stagnate and looking the same, then the person's career is in trouble. That ought to be the canary in the coal mine for an author situated with or considering a literary agent. Is that right? Yeah, because I think, especially if we're on the topic of children's books, middle grade and young adult in particular it's very trend driven and you can't you can't stagnate um there in a kind of separate genre of kind of women's fiction and romance i had a colleague who she said she wanted to be like the de facto person doing that it kind of goes back to our initial conversation about why i think it's better to diversify your portfolio and what happened was when the mass market business tanked she um, was in trouble because all her authors were writing just in that space. And she had kind of closed herself off to other ideas, other kinds of books. You know, she was in trouble at that point. It would be like, you know, what happened to Blockbuster? You know, if they had gotten out of VHS and gotten into kind of like what Netflix was doing, they would have been much better off. But it was too late by that point. Um, so I think part of it is that and there, keeping things like fresh and dynamic, interesting, lively, um, you know, seeing what the other kinds of possibilities are for your clients, you know, with publishers and how their books are marketed and promoted, you know, just never letting things um, go stale type thing. So um... Well, I wanted to ask um, about the type of work you provide with the client. So let's just do a, a for instance, um, say that the query comes in tomorrow. Uh, it's wonderful. And you call the author during that call. What kind of things are you checking for? How are you going to evaluate the author that based on this one book, you know, there's also going to be a career beyond it? So a query letter comes in, first of all, it should be well written because that's the author's first chance to kind of showcase their writing abilities. You know, the query letter is really their storefront into everything. 
And um, then if the meat and potatoes of the story sound good, sounds exciting in and of itself, the plot and all that, the character development, and it's coming through in the query letter and maybe the comps, the comparative titles in the query letter feel right. Like, oh, this is a book that I think could work well in the market or carve its place out in the marketplace. Um, and then I look at the author's bio too, their relevant writing experience, their writing credentials. If they've published in well-known literary magazines or journals or attended prestigious conferences or workshops, things like that. Sometimes these authors come to you with like endorsements already in hand from other, you know, well-known authors in the space in which they're writing, or at least the promise of it. And so if that's things like that are showing up in the query letter, I'll request the manuscript. And if the manuscript is, is well-written, just as, as the, you know, query letter promises, uh, then I offer the client representation. And then in doing so, I walk them through like, the, who, what the agency's like, who I am, what we do for our clients, you know, kind of what makes our business unique. And I share all my kinds of hopes and dreams for the future with the client and just tell them a little bit about what the deal-making process is like and, and all of that. And then they go out on submission and you have a conversation about how in the loop do, do they want to be in. They say, well, I, I have you, Mark, because you're going to worry about it, and I'm not even going to think about it until you come back to me, or are you updating them on a regular basis? How do you handle that? Does it vary from client to client? Uh, varies from client to client. So I have some people who are, it's like they're very masochistic. They're like, I want to know every pass as it comes in. And then <laughs> there are other people who say to me, I don't want to hear anything unless it's an offer. I just can't stand it. My skin isn't thick enough. Um, and then there are other people who say, well, let's check in every, you know, month or two or three months and then you just send me a batch of what you have and if i you know i guess i'll hear from you when i hear from you especially if it's an offer um so yeah it's different depending on the person and the submissions process we give it i say it's good to give at least three to four months but there are books i've sold in as little as like a couple of days you know there are books which you know took months um so every every author and every project or every submission is different. I assume when you say yes, you've already got in your mind some ideas of where you're going to submit to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I share the submission list with the client and craft a pitch. You know, we go out on submission to various editors at different publishing houses and, you know, try and field offers from them and negotiate to the best of terms and present the client with an offer. That's the ideal, you know, scenario. Um, you know, I like to cast a wide net in terms of the publishers I look at for clients. Because when I started out in doing this, I thought, oh, I'm just going to do submissions and rounds. And it was like, in most cases, it was like being stuck in purgatory. You know, I found that it was a much better result when you mixed a lot of people in because, you know, a, a younger editor or an editor at a, maybe even an independent publisher might feel more compelled to get, make, put an offer to get there, read quickly, get out there ahead of the big guys. And then that's a chance, an opportunity for me to quietly, but respectfully say to the other publishers, Hey, we have an offer in, I'm not saying for how much from who or how much, but you might want to make an offer of, of your own. And uh, in doing so, it can really light a fire under people. You know, they don't know if the offer is from, you know, Penguin Random House or Scholastic or what could be from anywhere. Those are very valuable tips. I think if uh, any literary agents are listening, and it, yeah. there's probably a few. Uh, if you're not doing that, maybe that's <laughs> that's something to do. Uh, so you get that going. And then how involved are you throughout the process? Do you want to be there with the client um as obviously through the contract but then when they're working with the editor yeah. do you want to be involved with that at all yeah a lot of agents unfortunately they just kind of check out after the book deal is done it's almost as though it were like you know that was it like they're on to the next thing because they're kind of trying to churn business again they're worried about where the next book deal is coming from me it's different because you know, I see myself staying at the company. I see the authors who are with me, growing with me in the company. 
So um, I like to be involved in the publishing process to help authors wherever they feel, you know, my help is wanted or needed by them. And so one of the things I do, for instance, I ask publishers for their marketing and publicity plans so that, you know, I can look at them with the client, we can try and comment and improve upon them at the same time, see the things we can be doing on our own to help the client. Um, I'll ask the publisher for things like a production calendar of events, which is basically, it looks like a calendar and then on different days written in the calendar are, here's when your cover is gonna be available. Here's when the first pass pages or the second pass pages, you know, the edited pages of your manuscript are gonna be available. Here's when we're gonna have ARCs or galleys so that the author's not in the dark. They know when to expect this stuff. They don't have to be asking the publisher all the time, when's it gonna happen, when's it coming in? And then they know how to be promoting their book. They can debut their cover because they know when the cover art's gonna be available to them, that type of thing. And then um, as far as promotion goes, um, obviously, you're going to negotiate the best possible terms with the publisher to hopefully get them investing in promotion, but the author's going to be needed to do some of that on their own. We, How do you recommend? Have, go ahead. Oh, well, you know, I mean, we we push the publisher to to do the best for all their publications. You know, one of the best ways to do that, obviously, is, you know, it's kind of this unfortunate thing, but it's really the more these publishers pay for a book, it's like the more they're going to put behind the book because I can guarantee you they walk, an editor walks into their sales conference or they walk into their next meeting and they say, okay, we paid this much money for a book. How are we going to make our investment back? That's kind of how publishers are thinking about it. It's really become a numbers game. You know, it's not just, oh, I love this book and that's why we got to market and promote the hell out of it. It's, I paid a lot of money for this book. We got to make this our money back. Um, so that's definitely a part of it. Advocating for the client in the deal process and the contract early on to kind of create that leverage for the client just naturally. And then, yeah, staying on the publisher and asking for their plans, you know, make arranging for calls and meetings for the client with the publisher to market and promote the book. And then working with the client to see what they can be doing, what we can be doing. Uh, to market and promote the book. Um, you know, we'll look at things with a publisher like the pre-order page for the book. You know, make sure that the publishers put the latest cover up there, that they have the jacket copy description just right, um, that the blurbs, the endorsements, the reviews as they come in, that they're feeding to the um, product page online, that type of thing. And so based on that, would it be fair to say that one of, maybe not the most, but one of the most important things you could do for the promotion of a book is negotiate the best possible advance up front to make sure they're going to protect that investment? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, that is, is one of the most obvious ways. Now, it doesn't always go that way. I mean, this, what we do is not an exact science. I've seen plenty of books where publishers paid a ton of money for it. They marketed the hell out of it. And then it was a very quiet publication. And then I've seen the opposite where, like we have this, this book, uh, Wonder by RJ Palacio. Most uh, publishers passed on that book. It sold for a very modest advance. What generated in royalties was phenomenal because it's still a number one New York Times bestseller in hardcover years after publication. You know, it's in over 50 languages, required readings in school, every major award, TV show. I think they're making it into a Broadway play now too. Um, so that, but that book, you know, almost came out of nowhere, kind of this left field type thing. And, um, so it's, it's hard to say, like, you never know where the success can come from, but you have to, you have to try everything you can. Cause it's not just drops in the bucket. Like, I think it's, it's drops in the lake and every time there's a disturbance in the lake, even though the water on the top seems very calm. There could be, you know, some fish under the lake, you know, just waiting for the bait. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I view it. Well, now I'm only interested in concrete, guaranteed to work strategies. Yeah. <laughs> there's no, there's no really like, okay, I pull this. Yeah, there's no like, I pull this lever and then my book comes alive like a Frankenstein monster and it can wreak havoc for me in the 
marketplace and, and do whatever I want it to do. No, it's not like that. It's like, I mean, there are some promotions which I think are good and strong and that every publisher should do. But sometimes it's like the right person picks up your book and talks about it in the right way. And then uh, it just becomes infectious or something, you know, like it's this water cooler conversation almost that begins around your book. Like the example I like to use is um, Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. Um, you know, he was basically a mid-list author for years. His editor, who I know, Jason Kaufman, who's at Canop now moved from publisher to publisher. I think he had gone from like, say Martin's to HarperCollins to Random House and basically took Dan Brown with him. And so Dan Brown's earlier publications were, you know, he relatively unknown. He was like a mid-list author. And um, he wrote The Da Vinci Code and out of nowhere became a bestseller. And publishers were scrambling to try and put out their own version of The Da Vinci Code. So there are a lot of kinds of these knockoff books, versions of The Da Vinci Code that came later, you know, because they were all trying to ride the crest of that wave, but it was sort of too late. They were already out behind the wave. Um, they couldn't find books in their backlist to republish that were similar. But what they did find when they went in their backlist what, and what they, they researched and what they discovered was there were a lot of people reading nonfiction books about subjects having to do with um, conspiracies in the Catholic Church, you know, concerning Mary Magdalene. What publishers then realized was there is a huge underserved audience of people who can't find this kind of book in fiction. So they're reading about it in nonfiction. And here unwittingly comes along this book serving their needs. And instantly they just jumped on it. They latched on and it, it became like, it was the water cooler effect, you know? When things like that happen, because obviously publishing uh, is not always 100% fair, or so I've heard, um, there are uh, things that happen that, that seem out of, certainly out of an office control, out of your control. I'm sure there have been moments at this point where you've wanted to bang your head against the desk a few times. Oh my gosh, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All of that and, and keep on an even keel and, and keep positive and, and assured that in the long run you're going to continue to win uh today i was sitting in the backyard and i was looking at a woodpecker hitting its head against a tree just thinking yeah i, I can think of all the metaphors of things in publishing that make me feel like that this woodpecker hitting its head against the tree right um obviously you realize they're they're designed to be able to do that and that animal's doing that for a reason but yeah, there are lots of things that can easily, yeah, frustrate. Um, like the, uh, w there's something, it's a phenomenon in publishing, but it's like, uh, if you ever visit a publishing house, sometimes it looks like Lord of the Flies. Like everyone working there is extremely young. They're just out of college. Uh, you have then people who come up in the business. Some of them stay a lifetime, but um, you have a lot of people in entertainment who are very young because the starting pay in, in publishing is never really good. You know, people are just happy to be in entertainment type of thing. And um, some of these, what really frustrates me is a lot of these people, they grow up, they learn a lot at the company, they become extremely good at what they do. Like they might be fantastic, a, public, a fantastic publicist or a fantastic marketer. And then the publisher decides, well, you're too expensive to keep here, you know, or we're not going to give you the promotion or the raise you think you deserve. And those people, they get frustrated and they move on and they leave the publishing house. They either go to different publishers or they go into different industries, you know, or adjacent industries. And then suddenly there's a new publicist and they're like right out of college. So it's extremely frustrating. I think publishers should really be investing in, in people and their talents and they will get a better result that way than to tr always be trying to do things on the cheap. And I think it's the same way with how they uh, treat or regard authors. They're always trying to, I see it in contracts and what they offer authors. They're trying to, you know, go cheapo on it. They don't want to pay authors what they deserve 
the, these publishers try to save money in a lot of instances, but authors are the lifeblood of book publishing. And therefore, if the lives of authors are good, their creative output is going to be good. And then everything else people experience in publishing, whether it be an agent or a publisher or what, will be much better. So that's the only thing that always baffled, kind of baffled me and, and frustrates me to have to see. But you can't just kind of suddenly change that. You kind of just got to cling to the blade of grass that you've got. And with that being the case, as we as we record this, there have just been some very high-profile uh, publishing exits from editors who blew up on Twitter. Uh, good for you. If you're going to quit, let us all know what's going on. So hopefully we can at least uh, address the program. Um, when that happens, uh, I'm assuming you still know about the imprint. You still know what types of books they need, what more or less to expect. But you've lost a contact, right, that you've been um, – that you've been – Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of times on the editorial side, I see a lot of editors, they go into freelance, they might move to a different publishing house or do something completely different. Um, there's also book publishing is very um, mater maternity uh, friendly because it, it's mostly women who work in book publishing. So a lot of women, uh, they'll, they'll have a baby and then they, it's like they're chemically rewired and they just want to then be at home and take care of the baby. And I get it. Um, some of them, they have the baby and then it's like, they come back with like a force you've never seen before, which is great. Like they know they need to provide for their family and this baby and this is the way to do it. Um, but yeah, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of changes like that. Editors do come and go a lot. Um, but yeah, we still have relationships with the publishing house itself and the publisher, you know, whoever that person may be. And we get to know or may already know like that the editor coming up into the that business to take over the handling of that author within the publishing company. And then, uh, of course, we have to talk about the pandemic because sooner or later, every conversation becomes a little bit about the pandemic, which is hopefully knock on every piece of wood there is. Um, moving into, if not a, moving into a new phase, if not, you know, on its way out. Uh, hopefully this won't age terribly and there'll be a, a new variant spiking. Um, but this has dramatically changed everything. It's not, not just that it's changed publishing. Uh, that combined with shipping shortages, boats of books sinking to the bottom of the ocean, all kinds of, of crazy stuff going on. Where do you see publishing at right now? If there's a glut of submissions, is this a good time for authors to be submitting? And then how do you think this will change publishing going forward, knowing that you can't tell us the future, but just your best guess would be fine? I'm going to try and keep the answer short, but I wrote about this actually, Publishers Weekly, they have um, an almanac of book publishing the, on the industry. They keep their finger on the pulse every year. They just kind of do a state of the industry kind of book. And they asked me to write the chapter on literary agents. And naturally they asked me to talk about the pandemic. And I talked about this in one other interview. I think the magazine is called Lit Mag. They're a relatively new magazine. They're on like their fourth issue. It interviewed me and, and Morgan Entrican, who he uh, is the publisher of uh, Grove Atlantic. So they asked the same thing. And basically what I said was early on in the pandemic, what happened was uh, a number of interesting things. Um, people were reading more than ever, which was great because they were at home, they had time to do that. They were writing more than ever. Um, they were buying books, but then stores shut down. So they were, had to buy their books online. Barnes and Noble had a lot of store closures. Publishers were operating then at limited capacity as a result. And people were buying books on Amazon, but then when they, their book orders were delayed, what happened was, um, they were turning to audiobooks and ebooks. And so there's a big uptick in those. Um, there was a push in the industry, I think like James Patterson and some other authors were behind it in saying books are essential, which, yeah, they are. I love books. But in a pandemic where people are dying, um, medicine, food, water, that's essential. You know, the book, you know, might not save a life in the same way. 
And so Amazon decided to prioritize essential items over books. And so books were further delayed uh, to that point, up until that point, people were reading a lot of uh, paperback classics, like suddenly, oh, I have time to read these massive tomes like War and Peace or Tales of Genji. Um, and um, so that, that kind of changed, there was a shift there. And then what also happened at that time was early on in the pandemic, there was an article in Publishers Weekly. They interviewed like a few agents from other agencies and asked them, what are you thinking of doing given the start of this pandemic? And a lot of these agents said, well, we're going to wait it out. It's probably, you know, maybe this thing will be over in a couple of weeks. <laughs> and so or, been nice. <laughs> or it could be a couple months, you know, but we're going to hold off on submissions is what they said. I read that and I thought, this is great. I'm going to be submitting books to publishers when my competitors are holding off from doing that because they just created a huge opening for me. Like I've seen that before where convent, like for instance, conventional wisdom always held in the publishing industry that you never submit a book in August and you never submit a book between Thanksgiving and New Year's because people are AWOL, you know, they're on their vacations or sabbatical or whatever. Terrible time to be submitting a book. One year I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to try it because in my mind, I was thinking, well, if no one's submitting a book, these editors, their desks are clear and they're just waiting for a submission. And it was as though I had, I submitted a book like, you know, in those times and uh, I had never been busier. And I said to one of my colleagues who I knew was doing the same thing. I, he has a lot more experience than me. He was a publisher at Viking at one point. I said to him, have you been really busy too around this time? He said, yeah, I've been submitting books. And I, he's like, I just did a few deals. I was like, yeah, me too. So that's what happened early in the pandemic. I did, uh, I think it was like three six figure deals for clients right within the first couple of weeks of the pandemic. And because I knew what was going through the minds of publishers, they look at their, they, they, they're not looking at books and seeing what's going on today all the time. They're thinking 12 to 18 months in the future because that is the timeline it takes from the date of a signed contract to publish a book or the date of delivery sometimes. So they're looking a year or sometimes two years ahead and they were already thinking of, well, eventually the pandemic will be behind us. It will be a brighter day. The people who are short-sighted kind of froze up with fear and stopped doing what they were doing. What you... What occurred later in the pandemic was it started to catch up to publishers. So they were feeling the hurt of physical retail being closed and all, and all this stuff, all these delays, you know, publications weren't coming out in, in time and stuff like that. So um, they started changing the way in which they paid authors rather than maybe paying half on signing of a contract, half on delivery of the manuscript, they then wanted to pay maybe in fourths, like so signing, delivery, hardcover publication, paperback publication. And in windowing those payments, what the publishers were doing for themselves was they were um, helping their own cash flow. And to us, we were like, you know, the client's going to get the money eventually. If it's going to help the publisher, sure, why not? It's not like they're paying authors less. Um, that was something we definitely noticed. We definitely saw. Uh, but no, publishers were still buying books. It was just editors were harder to reach because they weren't at their desks. Um, you know, I think some people were able to work better in the pandemic. Others, you know, it a, was a disaster for them to be working from home. You know, so I hope that those people realized that's about themselves and that in turn, publishing companies realized that about their employees. Like, authors weren't doing in-person events. So everything was online. And everyone who had a book published in 2020, you know, very few publishers were forgiving of that. So if you were a debut author in 2020, you know, publishers should have really been grading on a curve, but not everyone did. You know, unfortunately it was held against some people, even though it shouldn't have been. Anything that can be done about that, or it's just kind of one of those things that it is what it is. I suppose those authors have to think in the spirit of reinvention you know, how they can kind of reinvent themselves and their books in a new and different way and kind of start over, start anew. I don't know whether that's like a pen name or 
something like we're working with other people or what, but, you know, at, you know, it, it wasn't, it's not easy to convince the publishers um, to say, Hey, like this book could have sold a lot more if it just wasn't 2020. So uh, yeah, those are some of the things that, that were going on now. There's still delays. Um, I got an email the other week from a publisher who said, we're taking a galley order, you know, how many ARCs, how many galleys, whatever, this book do you want? And I said, wait a minute, we haven't even seen the cover yet. And the publisher said, well, we need to get out ahead of this because it's going to take a very long time when we put this order in to get galleys. So those are the kinds of things that are, are kind of going on. And hopefully there'll be a time where publishing catches up and then they start paying their editors more fairly and <laughs> everything will, will transform and, and, and become better, right? Yeah, I mean, they're going to be, <clears throat> they'll, there will be external forces that act upon publishing houses inevitably that will force them to kind of do better, to innovate, do better by their authors and, and innovate. You know, Amazon and ebooks and e-readers, you know, forced publishers into the ebook space. Before that, they were very reluctant to go into that space. Um, they're kind of still reluctant to be in that space in some ways. Um, and I think there will be other like external forces that act upon publishers. Like when Penguin and Random House merged, the DOJ under Obama should have stopped the merger from happening because as of now, Penguin Random House controls upward of 80% of the print market, the same way that Amazon has a monopoly on ebooks, on the ebook market. For some reason now, and I think it had to do with 2020 um, and the government taking more of an active role in companies and people's lives, um, they're trying to stop the merger of Simon and Schuster with Penguin Random House. You know, there's a lawsuit out against, uh, against it. Um, the merger between Penguin Random House, the way those companies positioned it was, we're going to make for a bigger company to be able to face down Amazon. And all they did in the process was they consolidated their businesses further. They basically kept the authors they liked, uh, fired the staff they didn't need because they had duplicate. You know, why do we need, you know, two or three science fiction and fantasy departments and then we can just have one? You know, so they were quietly getting rid of their back office and quietly getting rid of their real estate. So it was really a consolidation is what it was. And, um, you know, you went from like six major buyers down, down to five now. Before any of these big publishers were together, like you had many, many large independent publishers that you could go to. The, like the landscape of publishing was like so much more vast. It was, it was a better time. It was a healthier time for the industry and authors. And now there's just been way too much consolidation. So what can authors do and, and what does Trident Media Group do in the face of that? I mean, so in the face of that, we, you know, where we can, we've been outspoken against it. Um, in our contracts with publishers, you know, we fight them on our boilerplates. Like publishers in the age of the internet, um, because um, some of these publishers like Simon & Schuster or Skyhorse were publishing these conservative authors that upset people, you know, with some of their rhetoric or, or they published people who had um, kind of shady backgrounds and things like that. Um, they started, because of the backlash from it, publishers started putting in their publishing agreement something called the morality clause, which basically gives the publisher the power to cancel the contract on the author and force the author to repay all the money if the author in any way disparages the publisher or the author's own book or just even says anything online that the publisher deems, you know, you know, kind of off color or whatever. And it's terrible for authors because like, I mean, yes, on the one hand, it's meant to be like you keep people from, uh, you know, let's say they're spreading hate speech. Okay, you can keep them from doing that. But freedom of speech is kind of this double-edged sword where um, when you, you limit freedom of speech, you know, it can hurt people in other ways and it's a slippery slope. There's freedom of speech, but with, with a certain kind of license. And 
basically we had to fight publishers on, on a lot of these morality clauses and place limitations there. So they couldn't use that as a means to try and get out of publishing agreements with authors. You know, they couldn't use that as an excuse when maybe something like that wasn't really what occurred. Um, it's not because we don't want authors to be upstanding and moral. It's because we don't want publishers to use that against authors in any way, in a means to cancel their books. So we fight publishers on things like that. Well, it's such a strange thing to go to an author and say, hey, we're interested in you because you think things that other people don't think. And you say things that are different than what other people say. But by the way, we're also going to need you to conform. Well, yeah. <laughs> because then the publisher didn't like the backlash. They didn't like their employees were staging walkouts at the company. And then, but what other publishers started doing was when they, maybe they paid a lot of money for a book and then they were looking at their pre-order numbers and the pre-order numbers weren't looking so good. And they said, well, wait a minute, this person said this thing online about this. And because we have a morality clause, we can get all our money back from the publishing agreement and cancel it on this author and it, and just uh, wash our hands of it. That's where it becomes a problem. So yeah, we fight publishers on things like that, you know, things related to that. Yeah. Well, I'm watching our time and it's flown by. And, and I know that you have uh, just countless knowledge that are uncalculable knowledge that, that if only I knew the, the right questions to ask. Um, I do have a couple of fun ones I want to make sure I get in there and a couple of, I'm obligated to ask. So one question esteemed audience knows I have to ask because I ask everybody that comes on this show. Uh, Mark Gottlieb, have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? There are times where I thought I maybe saw or heard a ghost. I wasn't sure, but I think I might have. Yeah. And flying saucer, you know, there are things in the sky. It could have been anything, I suppose. You know, I... The universe is vast, so I'm never going to close myself off to ideas. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, another question, a little more serious question I, I have to ask, because I ask every publishing professional that comes on the show, um, and I always want to phrase this, that um, this is a situation that we find ourselves in that we're still in the midst of America's racial reckoning. And so when I, when I, when I signal out, publishing. I don't want to be like, there's the industry with the racism in it. No, it's an American industry. It was pretty much across the board for, for a long time and, and still is. But we know that traditionally publishing has had a problem with diversity and representation. We know that hopefully that's improving a little bit. What do you see publishing doing to improve that situation? And what is Trident Media Group doing to improve that? Uh, well, I mean, where I work, we have a lot of diverse authors, which, you know, we've sold to publishers. You know, the homepage of our website will exhibit that, you know, in an instant at a glance. Um, publishers, to their credit, have been voracious in acquiring a lot more books in that space. I write about this in a little bit in an article uh, I have on my blog called uh, We Need Diverse Jewish Books. And I talked about the history about how I think uh, the history of publishing and its background kind of we're living in the present day with what we have because of the way things are. Most people who work in book publishing are white, white and female, mostly. So in turn, what kinds of books are these editors going to be acquiring and publishing? I think some publishers, you know, looked at this for themselves. They looked, they took a hard look in the mirror and they said, we need more diversity at our companies. They started hiring, you know, more uh, diversity, but initially they kind of went about it in strange ways. Like at one of these publishing houses, they created a, like a diversity committee to try and foster this at the company. And the person they put in charge of it was a white woman which seems kind of backwards to me if you're trying to solve that problem. So, um, yeah, there's some, some stuff like that going on where publishers just sort of need to learn their way a little better. And then I think a lot of it too is, um, I don't know, people should write the books they want to write and publishers should, should publish the books they really want to publish and not fear the social media mob or any of that. Uh, early on in the diverse books movement, um, people could 
anyone could write a diverse book. Now it's very limited to you have to be of that background to publish that book. And I think it's limit that's limiting in some ways. You know, we're supposed to, it's like what Atticus Finch says, you have to walk, what does he say? You have to walk a mile in a man's shoes or, or whatever. Like, how are we going to learn to do that? I mean, yeah, we can read a book from someone in that, that perspective, but I think um, books will be very limited if people aren't able to think outside of themselves, basically. So that's kind of how I feel about it, but I just try to sell whatever I can to publishers that they are willing to buy and publish successfully. So if a client comes to you who's written about a character that's not reflective of their background, um, do you, do you pull them aside and say, Hey, let's, let's get um, uh, awesome. Authenticity readers is not the right, right term. Yeah. yeah we, we've done <laughs> stuff like that, like a sensitivity read or. That's you know, the one. Yeah, we've done some of that. Um, or for instance, I had a graphic novel, City of Dragons by Jamal Yogis, when it initially came to me, the main character, she was Chinese. And he was the writer on it. And I said, I think you should find a Chinese graphic um, artist, an artist to illustrate it. And maybe she could be half white, half Chinese. You know, so sometimes it's just like rolling with the punches, thinking of it in different ways that can kind of make more sense. Um, because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's kind of ruthless sometimes uh, how serious people are about this stuff. You wouldn't, you would think book publishing, really? Or even as particularly in children's books for some reason. But it's kind of like that movie Elf where, uh, with Will Ferrell, where they go and meet with the children's publisher. And like, they're like fighting in the conference room or whatever. And, you know, my, my friends are watching this movie with me saying, publishing's not like that and I said children's books in particular can get like that <laughs> <laughs> well a question I've been wanting to ask you since 2016 um, is when you answer uh, when you face the seven questions available now exclusively at middlegradeninja.com as teamed audience um, I ask everybody what your choice for lunch would be if you could if you could sit down with any writer living or dead for lunch and you picked Ralph Ellison uh, because uh, you, you said that Ellison claimed that more than 300 pages of his second novel manuscript were lost in the house fire. Uh, he eventually wrote more than 2,000 pages of his second novel, but he never finished it. Instead, he suffered from writer's block and stared at a blinking cursor for the rest of his life, a reality that a lot of authors experience after achieving immense success, which is something we must all overcome. So my question to you is you get, you get to have this lunch. It, it's going to happen. You're, you're sitting down, and the first part of the lunch is Ralph Ellison agrees to let you represent him going forward. I mean, obviously, uh, every everybody who's just heard how passionate you are about books agrees that Ellison's made the right decision there. So the next thing is, you're going to convince him to take those pages and put it into a book. What do you say to him? Oh, gosh. Well, assuming the house didn't burn down and the manuscript with it, um, I would tell him that, you know, it's really hard to have this feeling of, of having to replicate, you know, success. And just because you have that feeling doesn't make it so. You know, we're not as transparent as we might feel. And, um, you know, the work, despite how he might feel about it, it needs to get out there into the world and take flight and, and to do its own thing. You know, it's kind of like um, Tennessee Williams, famously, he would be revising plays as they were being performed on Broadway, and winning Tony Awards, and, you know, uh, and, and it was much to like his, his agents and editors chagrin, like, why are you revising your plays right now? They're published, they're being performed. He was such a perfectionist to a point where it wasn't healthy for, for him. Uh, and it wasn't conducive. It, maybe it was conducive to something. Maybe it helped his other writing or maybe just that part of his personality is what brought out his writing. But he, at least he had the sense to let those works out into the world. He wanted to keep making them better because he wanted to keep polishing his uh, abilities as a writer. It's no different than Hunter S. Thompson said, 
what he used to do to learn writing is he would get on a typewriter because it forced him to type with purpose and he would get out his favorite book whether it be um you know tolstoy or whoever uh, or uh, or maybe it was Herman Melville. Like, and what he would do is in reading the book, he would type each letter, each word, each sentence in those books because he wanted to learn how they did it, how they wrote. And by doing that, he was sort of walking in their footsteps. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, I think, healthy ways to be like a perfectionist and then there are like unhealthy ways too. I think that is the perfect note to end on. Yeah. Uh, Mark, this was just, this was amazing. I really appreciate you making the time for esteemed Thanks. audience and me. Where can they find you online, follow you on social media and all that good stuff? Um, I would say, you know, they should definitely visit our website, tridentmediagroup.com. My page is on the website from there. I think there's some links to like my blog, my social media accounts and stuff like that. Um, but that's definitely a good place to start. Uh, as always, esteemed audience, for uh, both a seven-question interview and a guest post with our guest, Mark Gottlieb, as well as interviews with thousands of other literary agents, editors, authors, all the world's finest people. More information about me and my books, also good stuff, head to middlegradeninja.com. And as always, God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.